these are some important accounting concepts that are going to come up in explanations later on when we talk about the software itself. We're going to use some terminology that you must have on top of mind. So, so some of these are basic accounting concepts, but I'm going to go through them no matter what. Uh, fixed assets, they're, they're purchased for long-term use and they're likely not convertible into cash, right? So for example, accounts receivable, a security deposit, inventory, all those things are easy to convert into cash. However, fixed assets are not. You have to, you know, it's, it's a much more complex sale um, to get rid of them. So as long as they, they kind of fall into that category or they're, they're used for production, um, they are considered to be a fixed asset. Now, a fixed asset uh, will have a life. Um, the lifespan should typically last more than a reporting period or more than an operating cycle. So for example, if I buy something that is going to last me exactly one year, it's really not worth it to call it a fixed asset and depreciate it um, because it's just not gonna span multiple accounting periods, then it just makes sense to just expense it. So I think general rule for me, uh, anyway, the way I treat them is they need to last at least one year. Now there's gonna be a value threshold, in other words, for example, I buy, I buy staplers and I buy calculators that last me years and years and years. So it does fit into the um, into the one year uh, rule that we were talking about earlier. And it is uh, you know not not easily convertible to cash because you would, technically people are not out there buying calculators and, <laughs> and staplers. Um, however, because of their value, it would be so much minutia to put in your balance sheet that there has to be a general accounting policy where you say, look, um, our company decided that X dollar amount will be the minimum value. So if it's less than that, doesn't matter if it falls into the quote unquote fixed asset definition, we're going to go ahead and expense it um, just because it's just not worth it uh, because of its value. Now, general rule for that for years, I think ever since I have worked with tax in 1998, for years, the general rule has been uh, $500. Now there's no there's no book that says this is the dollar amount. This is just kind of the general rule that was used throughout, uh, mostly because um, uh, the IRS published uh, something called the Safe Har Harbor Guidance, where they basically said, hey, you know, a general rule if it's more than five, $500, um, again, general rules are, like I said, general, right? There, there are some special cases in which they don't they don't count. However, in the past couple of years, we've seen fixed assets um, that uh, that people buy quite often be worth a lot more than five hundred dollars. You know, you have a phone, a laptop; those things are worth way more than five hundred bucks. So, Intuit actually, I mean, IRS last year upped that uh, safe harbor guidance to twenty five hundred. Now, whatever uh, policy you use internally, whatever. Um, whatever do dollar amount you use, it's up to you. There's no rule per company or company type, but you can start thinking about that $500 and that $2,500. Now, this will vary because, you know, a company like Apple or Google, they can buy a $10,000 computer and for them, that's peanuts. They're not going to put that in the balance sheet. They're only going to put, let's say, things are worth $50,000 and more. Uh, and the rest are expense, you know, but for a, a little guy like me, $10,000 investment is a really big one. It's significant in my balance sheet. So this whole uh, threshold, it's all based on the company and the size. And there's a little bit of subjective uh, reasoning for this. And that's really what the accountant's job is. Now, what is depreciation? Depreciation is the reduction of value, uh, reduction of value, um, of an asset with the passage of time. Um, typically, the wear and tear of the asset um, or, or representing the wear and tear of the asset, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's the purpose of depreciation. Now, there's also this concept of life expectancy. You know, if you have something that lasts five years, the wear and tear should be spread across five years. So that's what depreciation does. It, 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 it creates a mechanism to correctly book or account for that, that reduction in value over time. Now, this is represented as an expense called depreciation expense. 
that goes in the income statement or in the profit and loss. Depreciation follows the matching principle from the principles of accounting, which attempts to make sure that expenses match the related revenues. Now, accumulated depreciation is the same depreciation that you book, but it adds up over time. So two, three, four years worth of accumulated depreciation, it's all added together and it's booked in the balance sheet as a reduction of the asset value or a contra asset. Now, the book value is basically the original purchase price of the asset minus the accumulated uh, depreciation. So that's a really important concept because book value is something that we're going to be talking about uh, throughout here. Now, what are the components of depreciation or what are things that we need to know or have right off the bat, okay, right off the bat um, in order for us to do any sort of uh, depreciation? Now, number one, we need to know what the depreciable basis is. Now, in some cases, um, there's assets that have mixed use, uh, half personal, half business. And if that's the case, um, you have to back out the personal fun uh, portion of the asset because you can't depreciate that. Uh, so that's one of the uh, uh, one of the, the, the ways you can take uh, depreciable basis. Also, there are there's other uh, non-depreciable basis, which are things like land, for example. Land uh, cannot be depreciated, not for tax, not for accounting purposes. Land, in theory, doesn't lose value or doesn't wear and tear. So land is extracted from the depreciable uh, basis. So as long as you can identify what portion is depreciable, what, what part is not depreciable, that's kind of the starting point. Now, the useful life is extremely important, and there is general guidance on both the tax side. Um, on There's multiple uh, uh, publications explaining based on the type of the asset, the asset class, what their useful life is. And there's also guidance on uh, the CPA world uh, on, on, uh, on the gap side. But for the most part, I think it's going to have to be your judgment, too, in terms of, you know, how long an asset lasts. Now, assets that are well known, like vehicles or computers or furniture, those have specific rules and they must fall into five years, three years, seven years. OK, so you have to follow those specific uh, rules is not 100 uh, percent subjective. However, some assets that don't uh, fall into a particular category, things are new in nature in terms of what they are, brand new product, something that th doesn't fall into any category, then you're going to have to figure out that recovery period or that useful life. Now, the date that is placed into service is extremely important. OK, so this is not equal to the day you buy it. This is the day that is starting to be used in the operation. So a classic example is, let's say I buy a piece of real estate in March and I uh, from March to October, I uh, basically just add more improvements to it. And then in November, I start renting it. So that asset was placed in service in November to make sure that's accurate. Also, um, it, could, it could work the other way. You could, um, you could buy the asset, let's say, on December 15th and not pay for it until 2018, right? Because you had special, um, a special deal with the dealer that was giving you no interest for a couple of months or whatever. So it's when the asset is placed in service that is officially recognized. So it doesn't have to be paid or it doesn't have to match, sorry, it doesn't have to be paid right away or it doesn't have to uh, match the payment. So it's a really, really important one. Um, and last one is salvage value. Now for tax purposes, we typically ignore salvage value, but for accounting or for book purposes, uh, we do have to know salvage value because most uh, traditional accounting methods, I mean, uh, depreciation methods will take that in consideration. So the salvage value is what the, market value or resale value of the asset would be at the end of its useful life. So for example, if you're going to depreciate a truck for five years, it doesn't mean that it's worth literally nothing at the end of five years. It means it, it's going to be worth something. Um, you know, so we have to book that in order to consider what a depreciable basis is. So the mechanics of depreciation are pretty simple. You take the acquisition purchase price minus the non-depreciable portion minus the salvage value that gives you depreciation ba basis. 
And then if you go with the simplest level of depreciation, which is straight line depreciation, you take, you take that depreciable basis and you divide it by the recovery period. So if you're going to book depreciation annually and you have a five-year asset, you take the depreciable basis and you divide it by um, the years. And then that, that would be your annual depreciation. If you book depreciation monthly, then you're going to divide it by the number of months. So that will give you the depreciation amount that you need to book. Now, I'm going to get start getting a little bit deeper into this, right? Because it's really important to kind of um, uh, you know, slowly get deeper into it, but we're going to get uh, deeper into the methods before we go into QuickBooks. Now, straight line is this, as I mentioned earlier, this is the most simplest way to depreciate. You, you're actually allowed to depreciate in straight line as your uh, uh, normal or baseline uh, form of depreciation uh, for both tax and book. But you can also look into other uh, acceptable methods. Uh, for example, the output method, which I've in 15 years I've been practicing, I've never used, but this is useful for certain types of companies. If you have an asset that doesn't have um, a lifespan that is measured in time, but is measured in usage. So one of the, one of the examples is a boat engine or an airplane engine, right? Uh, with with boats, we don't really measure mileage the way we do with cars or with airplanes we don't measure mileage like we do with cars so we do the number of hours used and most manufacturers will say well this engine will last you before you have to overhaul it thousand hours ten thousand hours whatever so if you have a way to measure the units of production you can use that that output method okay but again i i don't use it a lot i don't deal with a lot of companies that have those type of assets but that's an acceptable uh, gap method now we have the double declining balance, which is an accelerated method that is most often used in tax. The double um, declining balance basically takes the, the depreciation of the year and calculates the, the book value. And then on the next year, it uh, you multiply that percentage times the book value ongoingly. So when, and we'll do an example of that. We have a slide on that. So what ends up happening is you take a lot more of the depreciation up front. Now, why does double declining balance exist? Well, uh, there's, an, there's an old saying that says, you know, when you go buy a used car, the minute you drive it off the lot, it, you lose whatever, 20% of its value, 25% of its value. I forget what the, the number is in that saying. But that is uh, displaying or illustrating, that's displaying or illustrating that there's a more immediate, higher level of reduction in asset value at the beginning and, and a much smaller or slower uh, towards the end of its life cycle. So when you're a taxpayer um, and you want to, uh, and you part ways with money to buy uh, an asset, you want to take as much as that as a deduction. Um, and what the, uh, the accelerated method does is it allows you to do so. Um, there's also the sum of digits, which I don't want to get to because I never use, but it's there and, and you have the slides if you want to research it or Google, but that's another accelerated method. Now let's do some comparison of straight line versus accelerated. So I think most people understand straight line extremely well, right? You take a $50,000 asset that would last you five years and has a, has a salvage value of 10,000, which basically means that the depreciable basis is 40,000, right? Because it's gonna be worth 10,000 when I sell it in five years. So I take that 40,000 and I multiply it times 20%. Now, why 20%? Because that's a fifth, right? Five years, a fifth. And, uh, and I book $8,000 of depreciation. And I start calculating my book value based on the asset value minus that depreciation. And then when I'm done depreciating at the, that the last fifth year, I'm going to be left just with the salvage value. So you notice that every single year I take an $8,000 uh, expense or $8,000 deduction. Now, why does, does the double declining balance work so well? And why was it even invented uh, for it? It's because we can take the asset value, multiply it times, that's why it says double, double, double the amount you would have in an uh, 
in a straight line method. And on the next year, you take the same percentage, but you multiply it times the book value. So you start seeing how you get, for example, on the last three years, on the double declining method, you get a much smaller deduction or expense than in the straight line. But if you look in the first two years, look at 8,000 versus 20,000 on the first year alone, you get a much faster depreciation. Again, this is with the purpose of um, illustrating or showing that the, the asset itself loses a lot more of its value within the first couple of years. Now, for tax purposes, I don't want to get too much into the weeds of, of the tax methods, but for tax purposes, you can read publication, uh, I think it's 552 or, or 952, I'll give you the number in a second. And it's a huge document that tells you exactly what percentage to use uh, when using a the, the accelerated accelerated method um, and there's also also something called the convention which I'll call it, I'll talk in a second so you find um, the 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 number of years that the asset is worth for example the seven year asset and then it'll tell you exactly how much to use right now um, the fixed asset manager will do that for you so you don't have to you know worry about going through the tables and stuff but these tables were existed basically for when people don't have a computer or tax software. Now, good. somebody's asking a question, um, why is there no uh, salvage value on double declining balance? That's actually part of the, 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 the method, right? A straight line uses salvage value, double declining does not. Okay, so you ignore salvage value with double declining. All right, so let's get in deeper into tax methods. So in uh, the IRS has... Uh, two, has basically three types of accelerated depreciation. It has the, the makers, which is the table I showed you earlier. It has something called Section 179, which actually allows you to fully depreciate 100% uh, of the asset. And there are certain rules in terms of uh, dollar limitations and stuff like that, um, the, the year that you put it in service. So what's really nice about this is you get 100% of the depreciation just as if you had expensed the asset, but you get to book it in the balance sheet with its depreciation, which I think is a much better presentation than putting it as an expense. Now, there's a limit. Uh, by the way, somebody here is telling me it's publication 946. Thank you, sorry. So um, uh, publication 946 is the, the IRS one. Um, and also somebody's asking, how do you come up with salvage value? So Amanda, you know, you, you would use scientific methods. Like, for example, if it's a car, you can take uh, the estimated blue book value, stuff like that. So you have to, um, you know, both subjectively and objectively look for methods to, to explain or prove, you know, how you figured out that salvage value. Anyway, going back to Section 179, there is a limit on how much Section 179 you can take on the year. So, for example, if I have a $30,000 taxable income that year, and I want to fully expense through Section 179 a $50,000 asset, I can only fully expense up to $30,000 uh, because that's limited to my taxable income, and the, 20, the, the difference of the 20 gets fully uh, suspended for the next year. So Section 179, it's there literally to make you pay zero tax, but it's not there to create a loss, okay? That's an extremely important um, uh, point. Uh, somebody here is saying the Donald Trump write-off. <laughs> yep, uh, he, he took uh, a couple of really big depreciations uh, that year. Anyway, um, bonus depreciation is a little bit different. So different tax years have different rules, but in certain tax years, there was this thing called 100% a bonus depreciation, which doesn't exist anymore. Um, it was then doing the recovery of, of the economy. They were trying to um, you know, encourage people to buy um, assets, even um, if it took them to a loss. So the nice thing about the bonus depreciation, which in today's world, I think there's a 30% and a 50%. I have to go back and check uh, next year's rules. But what's nice about bonus depreciation is you can take a much deeper um, depreciation the year that you buy it but you can go into a loss with the bonus depreciation. So think about a taxpayer that has, you know, multiple 
sources of income. So, for example, they have a salary and, uh, and they own the business and the business has a loss. Now they're going to get a refund or they're going to have a much smaller taxable basis. So a bonus depreciation is something that most people really like if it can take you into a loss and that loss can pass through and lower other taxable income um, that you have. So section 179, again, is obviously limited to the value of the asset, but also limited to, a ba- to the, the, the taxable income. Now, somebody else is asking um, that, uh, am I covering accounting rules or U.S. tax rules? Keith, these are U.S. tax rules. That's why we have IRS up there. I don't know what the uh, Canadian rules are or the U.K. rules are from whatever you may be connected from. So these are U.S. Uh, IRS rules. Now, the last important thing um, about uh, uh, tax considerations is something called the convention. So in regular accounting rules, if you have an asset that was put into service, let's say, you know, February 10th, then most people will just make their the uh the date of service, March 1st or February 1st. So it's a little bit of a loose interpretation. We can just take a full month or just start the next month um, it, it, because it's an estimate anyway. It's not a huge deal. But in tax, it doesn't work that way. In tax, you have to pick one of the three conventions. You either pick half year, mid-month, or quarter month. And most people don't really pick quarter month. It just happens. I'll discuss them in a second. So most assets, I would say most assets fall into half year. That means if you buy it January 1st or December 31st, you get the same depreciation, which is half year. You get half of the first uh, year. Um, Mid-month, it's mostly for real estate. So if you buy real estate, you get to take half of the month that you placed it into service and obviously every consequent uh, month for the year. And the quarter month, I mean, uh, the quarter, um, sorry, not quarter month. I don't know why I put that. It's mid quarter. <laughs> so the mid, uh, the mid quarter is a method that if you uh, buy most of your assets or you place most of your assets in service in the last quarter of the year, you can only take uh, basically a month and a half worth of depreciation. It, it defaults to the middle of the quarter. So this has to do with um, people trying to buy assets December 31st just to lower their taxes. And um, and what this method, the mid-quarter does is it reduces uh, the impact of the deduction on that. Okay. Um, all right. So that's okay. So so why did we why did we spend all this time? Okay. So why did we spend all this time talking about those basics is to get to this point: books versus tax. On tax returns, on U.S. tax returns we will apply tax methods. In QuickBooks, most people will either wait for the tax return to be done and book it. So basically their QuickBooks matches their tax return. That's what I call the easy life. (laughs) Um, I do that a lot of times, by the way. I mean, I don't have a lot of companies that actually require gap-based depreciation methods. However, if your company has to report in gap, generally accepted, accounting principles, right? If your um, company has to report in GAAP, you have to use GAAP methods only. So you have to use, uh, you know, straight line method or whatever method your company adapts. And you're going to have to keep basically two sets of depreciations in the book. You have to keep the book and the tax separate. And the difference between it, you have to book it in the tax return. So without getting too much into the weeds about the mechanics of it, in the tax return, there's something called the Schedule L, whether you're a corporation, a partnership, S corporation. The Schedule L is basically the place where you put the balance sheet, but the balance sheet on the Schedule L is the books balance sheet, not the quote unquote tax balance sheet. So if there's a difference in the reported depreciation and book value of the asset, you have to report that accumulation in the Schedule M1. And most people have to keep a spreadsheet or some other method of doing that. So this is the challenge. And this is where we, when we talk about the fixed asset manager, which we'll demonstrate in about 10 minutes, um, we'll talk about the value of, of, of the, 
of, of the tool and how both of those things get booked together. 